Unless anybody objects, I, I'd like to just record the TSC things in case someone from the TSC can't make it. Um, that way, uh, they'll be to catch up later. Does anybody have an issue with that? I would ask everybody, please, just for courtesy of everybody else, do not put this call on mute <laughs> or on hold. Uh, that beeping's going to drive me incessantly crazy. Um, Todd, if you can figure out whose line that is, maybe you can just disconnect them and let them dial back in when they get back. This is Mike. I did send out an agenda for today. I also, just before this call, uh, sent out the two candidates that we have for um, uh, the TSC chair position. Uh, in the agenda that I had drafted, I had uh, five to ten minutes up front for statements from the TSC chair nominees. Uh, we have two nominees, um, so I'd like to give them just three to five minutes to introduce themselves, say hello, um, you know, what their uh, view for the uh, hypoallergic is and whatever else they, they want to say to advocate. And um, I will keep you guys to a pretty hard five minutes, uh, no more than that, please, um, just so we can uh, keep moving. And, uh, you know, they're all, they're both available for uh, uh, questions, comments, uh, whatever, uh, after uh, the meeting. Uh, I encourage anybody who wants to get to know the candidates better to reach out via email or phone or uh, however uh, it would help. Uh, if you do need uh, contact info or something, just let Todd or I know, and uh, we'd be happy to provide that. Um, I, I think you nominated yourself first. Are you on the line? Do you want to kick it off? Or Emmanuel, whoever wants to go first. Uh, do we have Chris Ferris and Emmanuel on? Uh, I am on, yeah, this is Chris. Oh, Chris, do you want to just uh, give a quick... Yeah, so I'm... Th that beeping is really bugging me, too. <laughs> I don't know who it is. Yeah, uh, Todd, can we remove that person's line? Or just mute everyone and then... Uh... We can come off mute if they need be. Okay, that, that's worse. <laughs> yeah, that's even worse. Um, uh, Okay, can you hear me? Yep, that seems to have resolved it. Okay, and uh, I think this will stay unmuted. So hi, I'm, I'm Chris Hurst. I, um, I work for IBM. I'm IBM's representative to the TSC. Um, I'm an IBM Distinguished Engineer and CTO for our open technology, which means I have overall technical responsibility for all of our IBM's open source and open standards. Um, I've, uh, I, I've got a, a focus this year in particular on uh, this particular project to sort of help get it stood up and, and pointed in the right direction. Uh, I've got quite a bit of experience um, uh, in, in setting up you know, new organizations and getting the communities off the ground and, and, and thriving. Um, I worked uh, in particular on you know, getting IBM engaged in OpenStack and also Cloud Foundry. Um, but I've also got uh, extensive experience, as I noted in my, in my write-up, um, in sharing a number of uh, certainly open standards initiatives at the W3C um, and uh, web services interoperability and so forth. So um, I think I've got the, uh, the requisite uh, technical depth um, in my background um, and, uh, and, and the skills to, to help get this community uh, off the ground and, and running. Uh, I've got, I, I believe, and I think anybody who knows me uh, will probably attest that I'm, 
uh, fairly balanced in my approach. I don't necessarily bring uh, an IBM heavy you know position, and certainly in the context of where I've been chair of a working group, um, uh, I think uh, most people would recognize that um, I, I I typically you know am very clear about which hat I happen to be wearing at any given time, and uh, and I I try to sort of earn the trust of of the team. Um, uh, or the work group that I'm that I'm uh, leading, uh, without you know abusing the privilege and and, and uh, you know bringing just an IBM perspective. So uh, I think, like I said, I think I've got the depth and, and breadth and experience to do to do I think an effective job. Um, certainly, this is a priority for us uh, here at IBM to ensure the success of this project, and uh, I'm here to help do whatever that uh, whatever needs to be done to to help make it a success, whether I'm the chair or not. Right about. Okay. Um, I've unmuted everyone. Uh, I'm going to have to mute everybody if you don't go unmute. Um, Michael from Optimus Vantage, uh, your line is open. If you could go unmute, it would be helpful. Or I'll just tap you. All right. Um, Emmanuel, are you on? Emmanuel? I've unmuted everybody, so if you're on mute on your local phone, then it might not come over. Okay, it doesn't look like Emmanuel's joined yet. Um, so Emmanuel is the other candidate. Uh, his uh, bio is in the uh, email that I sent out to the mailing list. So uh, please do take a look um, and reach out to him if you uh, have any questions for him. All right, and then uh, we will run the election uh, as approved last week and get things kicked off. Um, uh, if I move forward on the agenda that I sent out, um, Next would be a code of conduct discussion. Chris Ferris, I think you had uh, volunteered to sort of lead through a discussion on this and pointed to the Cloud Foundry code of conduct. I didn't see anything else on the mailing list, so maybe I, I, I don't know if I missed that, but um, I don't know if there was a specific draft or anything that you had or just want to talk about it generally. I did see some questions of whether we needed one and some other comments back, but uh, that was about it. Yeah, I, th I think that was uh, all the, the conversation that I saw as well. Um, somebody sort of asking whether or not we need one. Um, I, I I actually teed up this discussion um, for a couple of reasons. Um, and first of all, it's in it's in the charter. We're supposed to pull one together. Um, uh, but also, you know, there was I think um, a little bit of shall we say, unwarranted uh, behavior um, in, 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 in one of the mailing lists. I don't remember which one it was, and I'm not going to call anybody out, certainly. But, um, you know, I, I think we have to, you know, sort of watch out for, you know, use of ad hominems and so forth when we, um, when we engage each other in the mailing list and keep it all civil and, and cordial. Um, uh, and, and I think that, you know, just sort of having a code of conduct reinforces that. It's not necessarily, you know, that we have some rules and so forth and, and we're going, you know, but I think it is valuable to sort of make a statement, make sure everybody sees and understands what we expect in, in the community um, and, uh, and have at least, you know, some ability to sort of point somebody to the code of conduct if we feel that their conduct is unbecoming. Um, and then hopefully that'll sort it out. Um, so I, I, I think it would be worthwhile to sort of, you know, think about this. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the note that I sent, um, I helped the Cloud Foundry Foundation craft their um, code of conduct. It was derived from work that we had started before the foundation was launched. Um, and, and that was, you know, we, we, we took a long look at a number of different code of conduct statements 
and policies from uh, from various groups um, that are all listed at the bottom of the Cloud Foundry one, um, and uh, you know tried to pull something together that sort of ensured that there was going to be you know. Uh, Well, that ensured that the community we brought together was going to be one that everybody wanted to be to be a member of. So, um, I, I mean, I, I don't know if we need to change it necessarily. I think it could, you know, we could sort of use it as is. We probably have to ask them, you know, for for an editable copy that we could change out some of the cloud copy bits. But um, you know, we could do that, or you know, we could form a small committee and and, and a few of us who have um, an interest in this could. Um, Work to try and craft our own, but sort of put that on the table. Can we ask questions, Todd? Mike? Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. open discussion. Sorry, hey, say, hey, Chris, this is Mick Bowman. Um, uh, how do you? So uh, I read through the material sent around, it actually looks great. Um, how do you, or how has it been applied um, in the past? You know, is this a uh, remove summer from the TSC kind of thing, or how do you see it actually being, other than a, a set of guidelines, useful? So, so the way, and again, Cloud Foundry is a little bit different than than this project because it's its own foundation, so it's its own legal entity and so forth. And um, to my knowledge. Um, Again, we would have to ask Sam or, or Chip Childers, Sam Ramji, who's the CEO, or Chip Childers, who's the, um, the VP of technology for Cloud Foundry Foundation, um, uh, if they've ever had to resort to sort of um, using the code of conduct. Uh, but basically, the, the approach that we agreed on was basically that, um, you know, if somebody felt that, you know, there was some behavior that needed uh, remediation, you know, that they would go to Sam or Chip. Uh, I think there's a, uh, a link in the thing that you know allows you to sort of send in a uh, um, a complaint, if you will. And then uh, Sam or Chip, I think, you know, coaches the individual uh, or individuals, as the case may be. Um, and so there's it's sort of a three strikes and you're out um, process that they have in play. And so they'll sort of just remind people of the code of conduct. If they don't, then they'll get a warning. And then if they don't, you know, if they continue to to misbehave, uh, then we can um, ask them to leave. Um, th there's, you know, again, it, it depends on the nature of the individual. If somebody's got a a position, you know, they can be sort of asked to step down. Um, again, these are all volunteer, you know, uh, endeavors. Uh, all open source is really and. Um, so, so I think the intention is not that we necessarily kick anybody out, but that we at least have a process in place that um, you know, somebody from the Millennium Foundation, for instance, could, could point to somebody and just sort of remind them that they should tone it down. Uh, two, two comments. One is um, how do you determine whether the complaint is warranted? Second comment is, uh, some of the uh, material seems overreach, like, for example, uh, silence is taken as an assent, um, meaning somehow that not calling out this behavior is taken to be also reprehensible uh, in the in the actual text of the of what you had put up, uh, one of the points was that if you're silent, that means you're somehow uh, assenting to that behavior. Which is, uh, you know, uh, going down a slippery slope there. Um, so obviously, we all can recognize uh, what bad behavior could be, but we may not all agree uh, on mm -hmm. what it is. So in the end, it's it, there is a judgment call involved. Of course, in the case of uh, flagrant violations, uh, you know, you can always uh, say. Uh, that that person is misbehaved, but if it's not as obvious, and if somebody complains, and that complaint itself is unwarranted, that's first and second is the silence aspect. 
so I, I think that those are those are fair comments. Um, you know, again, I wasn't saying we had to take this lock, stock, and barrel. I was sort of putting it up for discussion. I think you know, I think many would think that you know, when when somebody sees inappropriate behavior and doesn't say anything about it, um, that it, 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 you know, it isn't necessarily a scent, um, but um, it's it, in a sense, it's it's sort of accepting of that behavior, um, even if it you know isn't something that you would necessarily agree with. Um, you know, so you know, just you know, for an, for example, if somebody was, um, uh, you know, if, if somebody was insulting somebody else in in the mailing list, and you didn't call attention to that, and you know, all of us sort of remind, hey, you know, let's tone it down. Um, then it, it tends to, you know, again, it doesn't have to be public, right? But it tends to sort of reinforce the behavior. And and that can that can lead to situations that become um, more difficult to remediate because it's been, you know, because it's been going on for so long, right? And so somebody might think that it's acceptable behavior. Does that does that make sense? But I mean, again, yeah, I'm happy to you know have a conversation in, in about a, in how a, we can remove you know a statement like that, but. Yeah, I mean, obviously, um, if, uh, you know, people have to assent, but you have to see the size of this mailing list. If um, now, yeah. if everybody says, uh, you know, there are, let's say, I don't know how many people are on this mailing list, but uh, if a few people stand up and say, this is not good, are the other people who are remaining silent also assenting to this behavior? They obviously are not. Right. And uh, that can be a problem. Right. I mean, to say that you you're silent. I mean, I I get your point that it's creating a climate of uh, assent to this kind of behavior. It is doing all kinds of stuff like that. But yeah, sure. But I'm I'm saying you know the wording should be kept. This was the comment from the other person who said there should be no call of conduct because basically that that means that everybody recognizes what good behavior is and. Yes, you know, it's, right. not, it's not like it's not like uh, we don't know what uh, racism right. or sexism or ageism or whatever it is sound like, and we don't know what uh, insults sound like. Uh, yeah. But uh, we cannot possibly police every aspect of this, and no, uh, I, nor should a nor should a co code of conduct cover all possible cases. So um, keep it simple, no, I, in other words. Yep. No, I think that's I think that's fair feedback. Um, you know, again, we looked at a number of these, and there have been, you know, in 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 the history of all open source, there have been many occasions, and um, actually, uh, sort of, um, uh, I wouldn't necessarily call it discrimination as much as 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 um, you know, some some women in our industry tend to feel, you know, um, sometimes that. You know they're not treated um, the same, and that there's a certain amount of um, uh, I don't know bias or you know whatever against them, and 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 it, it can tend to be I don't want to say ignored, but not necessarily recognized for what it is because, um, well, frankly, guys don't necessarily have the same perspective as other women might have. Uh, in that context, so I, 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 again, I'm, I think that you know, uh, I, again, I, I think it would be valuable if we were to get together and agree on the set of guidelines that we wanted to choose for our community. It doesn't have to be as prescriptive as this one, um, but I do think that it's important that we at least outline sort of what the mores should be in our group um, or shouldn't be. Um, without necessarily being over, overly prescriptive, uh, excuse me, prescriptive, and also without necessarily having a, a specific process as this does um, for, for for having to necessarily deal with it. But pardon me, it just you know it just sort of I think is important that we we lay the groundwork for. Well, I mean, unfortunately, you know, weird 
and and bad things do 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 tend to happen out in these sort of public. Yeah, as long as people get hooted, you know, you have heated discussions, and it can all of a sudden turn into a little bit of ugliness, and, and we just don't need that. I, I, this is Mike Donald from Linux Foundation. I, I will say, as you know, one of the two lawyers at the foundation, and the fact that we oversee so many projects now, um, it is very unfortunate. But we run into this more often than 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 I than I feel comfortable as a human being admitting. Um, it's just very unfortunate what some of these conversations can devolve into. With yeah. and it's it's not typically the TSC members or anybody who's a committer or maintainer. You know, the ones where we have to reprimand people are you know. <laughs> Random people who show up just to pile on and and uh, you know spur on even further worse behavior. And so, it does help to have a published set of guidelines that you can point to to say, you know, this is outside those bounds. Um, the process for how you handle disputes if they should arise is usually done in a in a you know as Chris mentioned. They, I think on, on Cloud Foundry they do use a three strikes rule. Um, some of our other projects. There's like a TSC private list where they will handle any complaints like that to a TSC private mailing list. So that's um, handled amongst the TSC members to decide how to uh, respond. Um, on other projects, the governing board handles it. Um, I'm open to you know, any ideas about how you guys might want to adjust the code of conduct or uh, the process for it. But I do think it would behoove you, given the uh, comments I've already seen, and had to moderate, and uh, you know the fact that they're already happening to put something in place so that we can at least point to something. And you know, I, I don't expect the TSC members to run afoul of this. Uh, hopefully not. Uh, I've never seen that mm -hmm. happen. Um, but it's more for you know just general community conduct to make sure that we have a policy to point to to say you know that's unacceptable behavior. And it, fortunately, this does happen. It, it really does. It's unfortunate. I've seen yeah. every type of bad acting behavior that I can think of and uh, it disgusts me but it happens. It would be good if someone could make a statement in, I don't know, maybe in the code of conduct, maybe someplace else about how we should react because as someone mentioned there was a, a you know, one, one particular person who said some things then very soon after that and, and I objected, I, I didn't say anything about it but I, I thought it was not good, and then someone came back and said maybe that was a little bit too harsh, and then they went on and you know and it seemed all civil after that. So I felt like okay, someone responded, that was dealt with. The fact that I didn't respond didn't mean I was supporting that bad behavior, and so I I, I would just hope, hope that someone who does act up, if they have one or two people say that was wrong, they don't say well, 95 people didn't say so, so they must support my you know, bad beha my behavior. I, I would just hope that that is, you know, silence isn't, you know, uh, taken as a vote for that behavior. Yeah, well, I, I think Chris is pointing to one, you know, code of conduct. There's obviously other examples. Um, you know, I, I think this one is interesting just in terms of it, it is it is a fairly modern code of conduct. It's been fairly thoroughly reviewed. If the silence is assent, uh, you know, one is is throwing everyone off, then. Maybe we should look at you know phrasing that differently. That you know maybe it's you know encourage that the community speak out against any bad behavior it sees or something like that. That way it's not you know silence is assent. But um, you know with that one change, that, that seems to be the one that's got it up. But uh, if you want to do like a small group to work on this, uh, if a few people are interested in working together on it, we can get that going um, and bring a proposal back. Or just work out through the mailing list. Um, want to make sure. No, that's good. It, yeah, that sounds good. And and you know, using the code of conduct as a way of sort of capturing the culture we expect in the group um, seems like a, a really good idea. Um, uh, and I'm happy to help Chris at least in the uh, or whoever wants to help work on it um, do some editing, or we can do it on the mailing list. Either one. Thanks, Mike. If I could ask, maybe you and Chris could, you know, just work on getting this, a draft together that looks reasonable, and then send that out to the mailing list for comments and work it through there. Would that be okay? Sounds good to me. Chris, I'll get in touch with you yeah. offline. Yeah. Thanks, Mike. Okay. 
Any uh, further comments on code of conduct before we move on? Okay, uh, Mick, I'm going to turn over, make you presenter here. Um, or do you want me to share your slides? Um, um, let me see. I've got it up. Uh, okay, no promises that this is going to work. I'm not a go-to-meeting expert, so uh, oh, yeah. uh, I, I think I I'm do sharing. It. Does that work? I don't see you sharing. Did you click the show button on the right hand side? Uh, Top? Yeah. I I, I, yeah, see I can it. see it. Yeah, I'm seeing it. Okay. Oh, okay. It worked. And I wanted to keep this really fast. I, and it's mostly just, um, uh, you know, we we've talked about this. We're in progress. Um, you know, no promises on what the final results will be. Um, you know, everyone has dealt with internal processes before. Um, but I wanted to at least give you an idea about the kinds of things that we're talking about fairly publicly about this um, and and just um, set some expectations. Um, so this is going to be really quick, high level um, overview of what we're doing. Um, so um, unlike um, the other contributions, um, the project that that we've been working on at Intel, you know, it is a complete ledger. We're using it for real applications, um, but it really came out of and was principally architected as a research platform for us to understand um, and characterize some of the, char the the properties of the different kind of consensus algorithms. And I guess that effect. Um, Anyway, to, to characterize some of the characteristics or properties of these of these algorithms, um, uh, so that that research focus really came through as in an architecture where absolutely everything is plug and play, um, topology algorithms, uh, communications, um, uh, consensus algorithms, um, all the way up to the semantics of the of transactions um, is all plug and play. Um, and and I will say that because it started out of that as a you know as a research project, our architectural decisions and implementation decisions were for extensibility, uh, not for local performance. Um, so we were more concerned about protocols and interfaces than about the uh, particular details of uh, what the correct database should be for uh, journaling um, blockchains. Um, uh, we are in the process of uh, hardening that code um, to the level at which we would be comfortable doing public proofs of concept, and in fact, we're doing some uh, internal uh, marketplaces I'll talk about in a minute, um, where we're actually making it available to uh, outside the comforts of the lab uh, for application use that way. Um, Yeah. So, uh, like pretty much every other proposal, um, there's three basic layers: the communication layer, which is something that um, uh, uh, let's see, there's not really much in the way of innovation there, except in the sense of uh, interactions related to topology and topology creation, which is actually something that has not been examined very much in the academic literature, at least so far, when talking about. Um, some of the existing Bitcoin blockchain algorithms. Um, so uh, there's some work that's been done there that we can talk about. Um, the, the, I think the important thing is, is that in the journal and ledger layers, what we're really doing is driving for separation of uh, transaction consensus from transaction semantics. So um, the journaling layer is all about uh, consensus of a set of identifiers, um, and whether or not those identifiers are valid is punted up to um, what we're calling the ledger layer, and that's actually where we in, where we uh, implement and enforce a set of semantics on it. Um, the the validator interface that we have supports both light and uh, full validation um, participation. Um, we have a set of gossip protocols that have been implemented for. Uh, Intervalidator communication and a bunch of uh, different kinds of HTTP interfaces that allow observer and transactors to participate 
in the net in the network. Um, so, uh, like I said, communication is kind of a boring layer, so I'm going to skip past that for the most part. Um, uh, our approach to doing um, pluggable consensus um, is uh, really through identification of a few um, common events and then allowing the different consensus algorithms to provide handlers for each of those events. So there are things like, you know, a transaction has come in, how do we add it to our, to our pending queue? Um, uh, it's time to actually build a block, how do we decide which transactions go in the block? And, and that's interesting because, for example, in some cases there's no prioritization of those, in other cases there is prioritization. Um, uh, there's claiming, which is some form of I've been elected the leader or I'm participating in the block claim, um, make it work. And then we have a bunch of things that are sort of out calls. Um, uh, in the case of the validation, it's a call up to the transaction, uh, the ledger layer in order to make sure that the semantics are correct for it. Um, and uh, we're also doing a fair amount with incentives. So. Um, I'm, let me use this as a moment to point out that um, uh, while a lot of the discussions in this group has been around kind of permission ledgers where uh, most of the incentives we can talk about are extrinsic, um, you know, there is value in the transactions that's sufficient to justify participating in validation. Um, we at, at Intel are concerned about um, usages where uh, not necessarily cryptocurrency kinds of things, but open marketplaces and consumer applications where, uh, where incentives need to be intrinsic as well. Um, and so the architecture supports both extrinsic and intrinsic uh, forms of, of incentives. Um, I'll come back to this in a minute, but we've implemented both. Uh, I mean, we're, we're kind of classifying the protocols for consensus in two forms. One is the lottery form that's used by, uh, by the kind of proof of star um, algorithms. It, there are nice characteristics, but as we all know, the liveness properties in business teen fault tolerance require handling of rollbacks for most of those algorithms. And then the sort of traditional business teen fault tolerance and, and fault tolerant algorithms that are essentially forms of voting algorithms. Um, so we've got implementations of a consensus algorithm of our own, which replaces proof of work um, with a proof of processor. Um, and we've also done implementations of, of uh, a quorum voting that looks remarkably like the, uh, the protocol that Ripple uses uh, for consensus. Um, and that allowed us to actually do studies and comparisons of, of performance and scalability characteristics of the two different approaches, which was really our focus. Um, like I said, um, we, we punt semantics up into, this, into what we're calling the ledger layer. Um, and this really came out of um, the observation over the last year of countless numbers of kind of transaction semantics trying to be wedged into the Bitcoin UTXO. Um, and, and while it's done remarkably well, many of those are, uh, shall we say, unnatural pairings of semantics of the, trans of the intended transaction to the actual expression of those in the in the transaction uh, scripting language that's available with with Bitcoin, um, and what we wanted to do was to actually step back and and allow people to actually define transactions the way that they wanted to. Um, uh, we map these into independent, currently independent transaction families, each which has their own set of rules for semantics and their own state that can be carried out. So consensus and validation. Consensus can occur across multiple semantic domains of transactions. It's independent, um, and then the families can sit on top of it. Um, and and you know, back to that modularity and research thing. You know, we implemented three different families, which are completely different in their semantics, primarily for the purpose of testing out the modularity of the interface, uh, but also um, because we actually find them useful. Um, so we have one that we use for. Uh, providing configuration, um, and it's a channel for managing uh, information about the endpoints. Uh, we've got another which we use for scalability testing, and another which is our kind of marketplace um, uh, functionality. 
Um, so going a little bit more on that marketplace, um, you know, it's it, it's not rocket science. You know, it's basically three pieces. That's uh, participants are the who, assets are the what, um, and we have a concept of a holding, which is a mapping from the who's to the what's, which um, uh, is intended to know ownership. Um, and then transactions essentially move things, move or change or transfer ownership from one participant to another. Um, we do not just payment but bi-directional exchange um, and we can have multi endpoint um, exchange as well uh, with a notion of pending offers. So exchanges match offers um, in that point. But the real important thing here was again that, that we built this out in a fairly complete way um, primarily for the purpose of uh, ensuring that um, we were getting the right uh, interfaces for the APIs, but also um, to ensure that the consensus algorithms underneath were robust enough to accommodate um, a variety of different relatively complete semantics. Um, and, you know, just uh, for for uh, testing things in the wild, um, uh, we're actually taking that marketplace out and we're running an um, a internal trial, and I, I will say internal, it's open to anyone at Intel, um, trial that we're running, which is a, okay, it's a football exchange here, but uh, it'll really be a uh, NCAA basketball pool kind of game um, where uh, you actually exchange shares of teams. Um, so our expectation is that that's going to give us some insight into uh, real workloads uh, running in the wild on consumer uh, for consumer kinds of applications as well. Um, and so let me just uh, um, kind of conclude with a little bit of information about status. Um, Current, the implementations in Python, again, the choice on that was uh, based on our focus on extensibility and modularity and changing behaviors as quickly as possible. Uh, that being said, anyone who's implemented in Python knows that anything you do that's high compute needs to be moved someplace else. Um, and so all of our ECDSA and crypto and a number of other data interactions, um, we move out. Um, all communication. Uh, between validators is CBOR. Um, the transactors and observers can communicate with messages in, in either JSON or CBOR. Um, okay, so the the most unique aspect of this, and this is sort of the the, the central part of the experimentation, was um, we are uh, looking for ways in which we can uh, take advantage of uh, the Secure Guard extensions, the trusted execution environment, as a way of improving performance and resilience of these blockchain algorithms. So there's been a fair amount of work in the, in the academic community about how you can provide relatively simple trusted primitives that do um, some <clears throat> uh, a slight constant time improvements on uh, the various Byzantine fault tolerant algorithms who we wanted to apply some of those, do some testing on that, um, and also do some testing on alternative consensus algorithms. Um, and so we have uh, a consensus protocol that looks an awful lot like what's currently used um, in Bitcoin's blockchain, except that we replace uh, proof of work with something that we're calling proof of processor. Um, and so we're using SGX uh, as a way of uh, uh, I guess called generating lottery tickets for leadership election in a fair way that also prevents civil attacks that way. Um, per the discussion that I had last week, or the, the couple of the comments that I made last week, one of the things that that um, we are uh, are very interested in is um, uh, evaluating platforms based on um, uh, workloads so that requirements can be uh, discussed, but they get expressed in terms of, of a collection of uh, scenarios or test cases or workloads that can be applied for uh, systemic testing. Um, and we've got a variety of, of suites of tests that we're applying um, 
Uh, we have a transaction family specifically for scalability tests. Uh, we've also done some work in um, doing replay of the Bitcoin transaction log um, as a way of uh, uh, kind of testing both resilience and um, uh, performance. Uh, so we can replay the, the transactions sped up in order to give us um, uh, a better feel for what happens at high transaction rates. Um, and we can run those kind of tests again on a variety of, of physical platforms that allow us to, to um, uh, modify uh, things like drop rates, latency, and other things like that in the network. For it. Um, so that's, uh, I think I kept it in my 10 minutes. Um, so that's basically uh, what we're planning on providing. Um, uh, I think the, um, the core of our interest um, is in um, finding ways that we can use uh, the kind of crypto acceleration that Intel provides and um, the, the trust execution environments as ways of improving resiliency um, and performance. So. Question? About the testing, do you have any way of simulating um, network partitions that then may be run for a certain amount of time before it heal and then see what how things uh, progress after that? Um, uh, right now, partitions are done. When we do, when I do partition tests, we do it by hand. Um, we go in and force drop of a collection of links that, that partitions the network, and then reconstruct those links. Okay. So, so yes, but that part is not automated yet. Um, and that's I, and we've we run. Um, right now, the the largest tests that I've been running are around two thousand validators. Um, uh, that we're running in a in a cloud, um, which is enough to give us some interesting characteristics, but it does make partitioning hard. And you indicated you have some control over latency. Can so can you you know dial in some you know essentially force some participants to be extremely uh, high latency. Uh, while others are extremely low latency, and then uh, see how that affects uh, consensus. Yes, uh, and in fact, we do that a fair amount because we wanted to. Uh, one of our one thing we were interested in is um, uh, what are the real characteristics of forks in uh, blockchain type consensus algorithms, um, and so. Uh, Setting up a, uh, a number of connections with relatively high latency. Um, so, I, okay, network partitions for thousand. Node, getting a partition that breaks a thousand node network is uh, challenging, um, but getting some subset to have really bad latency is fairly common, and that's relatively easy for us to test. And that's the approach we've been taking on it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, that's all for me then. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions for Mick? If not, we'll move on. Uh, just, just really quickly. So, how, how long do you uh, if you're asking a question, we lost you. Whoever is asking that question, you got cut off there. Uh, they may have dropped. <laughs> or they completely Mick, dropped off. Mm -hmm. Mick, I think what they were asking is, uh, if I had to guess, how long before the codes can be available, maybe? Um, I'm yeah. hoping within the next three or four weeks. Uh, we are accelerating the process as fast as we can. We had not, this was not something we had intended to do until uh, probably mid-January, late January. So. Um, yep. So we're no, going. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Everybody's got to go through their process, and I know some others are going through their yeah. process for things. So um, it's helpful to know. Um, 
questions. I'm sorry, this, this is Dave. I, I accidentally got dropped. I was just wanted to ask a question. When, when, how, how much longer do we think it's going to be before um, Intel will be able to, you know, post some more detailed documentation in the code? Um, probably in the three or four week time frame. If I'm knowing, having run through this process with other projects, um, is probably in that three to four week time frame. Okay, thanks. And, and and again, that's not a promise in any sense. It's that's about the time scale that's taken in the past. All right. What's okay. next, Mike? All right, thanks, Mick. Um, next, uh, I'd asked, uh, so Stefan and uh, Vipin were working on uh, coming up with a proposal template. We had sent them a couple of ideas, starting points, um, you know, from other projects that we host. Um, I think, Vipin, you sent that out to the TSC mailing list. Um, I saw that come through about five minutes before the meeting. Um, do you want to just give a quick uh, intro to what's what's there and uh, what you want from the group. Yeah, uh, my name is Vipin Bharatan. Um, unfortunately, I don't think Stefan is on the call. And uh, I think uh, in the beginning, uh, oh, Stefan, you. oh, you are here. Great, uh, Stefan. I think uh, you could correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, you had thought that this was. Uh, something else, meaning uh, it was for a new proposal rather than a proposal template. Yeah, um, so I, I was so working on the assumption that um, the template that was, that was to be created was a template to evaluate proposed um, code bases against, you know, like collecting criteria for proposed code bases instead of, you know, um, a, gener a generic template for whatever kind of project. Anyway, so I took a crack at uh, things uh, with uh, taking into account uh, Stefan's uh, input and also uh, input from Mike and uh, Todd and also some of the material that I read. But, uh, you know, what I have to say is that it's very rough uh, um, and I had sent it out to the list, but I think it bounced because I sent it from an uh, email that was not on the list. Um, the other one was just a forwarding email. But anyway, uh, the main thing that I think uh, that, I mean, you know, the one of the things is how do we get this uh, situated so that it actually helps people uh, uh, think about their project in, 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 uh, in a very structured terms and then uh, put it up for a proposal so that everybody can have a look at it and then um, come back with comments or you know say why is this needed because it already is fulfilled by X you know something else uh, so some of the thoughts I had was uh, you know that it's not going to be a um, concrete uh, you know, fully developed thing right in the beginning. It it probably would evolve. Uh, so initially, I thought that in the project proposal template, we should say that the new project proposal uh, has to be sort of vetted in a public forum, uh, like a hyper ledger technical, uh, before creating a a formal uh, project proposal, and it needs a technical champion, somebody who's uh, behind the project and leads the project, um, you know, who's come up with the idea, leads the project, and keeps it uh, moving forward with consensus, uh, and uh, and so on and so forth. And that is very important. Otherwise, the project will die and, and wither on the vine. The uh, proposal template um, needs to have certain elements, um, which is commonly no, noted as, you know, basically the author's name, the author uh, plural uh, name and contact details, and a sh short name for the project, you know, very succinct name. Uh, and I had come up with the acronym uh, following Bitcoin um, uh, 
improvement uh, proposal for it to be called Hyperledger Improvement Proposal HIP. The other uh, elements are an abstract, which is you know about a 50-word description of the project, and then um, a full description uh, substantiating um, uh, the need for the project. It should cover all uh, aspects, including you know starting with transactions, uh, some of the items covered by uh, Mick uh, just now, uh, things like confidentiality, signing, traceability, uh, if, if any, you know, it depends on the project. Identity, uh, contracts, uh, the other is uh, effects on use of facing clients uh, that help with transaction formation, uh, you know, similar to the wallets in, uh, in Bitcoin. Effects of the uh, on the network throughput visibility to other participants change in protocol if any criteria for network participation like does do you have to uh, have a special uh, invitation to participate uh, then block formation and ledger formation uh, namely the consensus algorithm size overhead uh, effects of the throughput and uh, rate. Um, Crypto implications, uh, backward compatibility, what, is it going to cause a hard fork or some kind of a, uh, a split uh, you know, um, in the network? And uh, the rough design and thought, uh, some kind of a thought experiment uh, on the probable effects. Um, and address any possible objections uh, that came up during the seed proposal to the list or uh, come up with uh, support from the seed proposal that came up from the list and traceability uh, testing criteria to gauge the effects on installed base any other technical details including languages used other technology needed uh, preferably uh, public sources or if uh, source from somewhere else uh, you know easy way to get that and um, the references and defense uh, again, of why this is needed, um, then they then a rough uh, timeline and the resources committed, um, coders or anybody else who's already volunteered for the project and their contacts, if any. Uh, that is the technical uh, aura around the project. The other part would be the uh, readability part, which there would be some guidelines about the readability because. Communication is uh, very uh, essential, meaning the uh, clarity and the explanation of abbreviations, uh, diagrams, those kind of things. Uh, and this should be helped by somebody who's appointed as an editor, if possible, uh, or editors uh, to help the uh, you know help people along in a project proposal. So these were. You know that this is in short the list that I had sent out on the uh, you know to the list and also to Mike and everybody else. So there is a question up already, which says something about a uh, what do you understand as a project in the scope of the Hyperledger project? I don't, I don't put any limitations on this. I mean, this is my current understanding that it's it's a standalone, you know, uh, piece of work that enhances, extends, or somehow changes the uh, hyperledger project, and it can be uh, put in as a as a as a block, as an atom, or taken out. Are you guys? Uh, do you guys hear me? Uh, there seem to be some interference. I, I hear you, Vipin. Uh, somebody's not on mute who probably should be, or maybe they're waiting to ask a question. Okay. Um, so that, that's uh, the initial proposal. So the main points are like, you know, it should be basically to help people, uh, you know, implement a proposal. Uh, two, there should be some help from the technical steering committee, like uh, members. Three is 
you know, it should cover all of those different aspects that are in the in the list that I sent out. Otherwise, you guys are free to propose other things that are not covered there. Uh, you know, four is obviously if um, if the project is approved. I mean, so I didn't go into the approval process, which I I, I don't know anything about because I, I, this is my second meeting. So, and I'm not affiliated with the you know I'm not a member of the steering committee or anything like that. So, uh, from a uh, outsider's viewpoint, this is this is what I thought it should be. So. Um, any questions or comments, and I will continue to, you know, refine this. Or if I'm going in the totally, in a totally wrong direction, let me know. Whatever. Yeah, Vipin, if I could, uh, this is Mike. Uh, let's just to try to keep on schedule here as possibly chaos Um uh, Maybe we can defer uh, any discussion of this to the mailing list. And uh, I, I think what Vipin's asking for is for the Technical Steering Committee to weigh in and uh, provide some guidance in terms of, uh, you know, what you, what you expect to see. This, this is a project proposal template that eventually will be used by the TSC to evaluate new project proposals. And so, if somebody wants to create a new project within Hyperledger, you know, what do you want to see? How will you want to evaluate it? Uh, most of our projects have, you know, what I'll call top-level projects, and then they'll have even some have sub-projects. Uh, but a project would be, you know, equivalent to, so to speak, a, a repo on on, uh, on on GitHub. It could be, you know, sub sub element or component that uh, you know different repos are are leveraging as a, a library or module um, you know that is sort of goes hand in hand with sort of the structure that will be set up um, I ask the community to start thinking about this because it's good to have a sense of where this is going early on so we're not thinking about this you know as the TSC is trying to approve uh, a new project a new code base into the project so um, it's good to start thinking about this early on in conjunction as, you know, I know a number of discussions are underway around, you know, starting code base and, and other elements of, you know, what that will look like. But, you know, even if you pick a starting code base or code bases, I should say, um, you know, at some point you have to structurally uh, set up projects uh, to, you know, put those code bases into uh, action in the community. And so in order to do that, you know, a project with proposal template is usually helpful. Um, another element that I, I don't think Vipin you touched on, but some of our other projects look at is sort of a project life cycle. I don't know if the TSC wants to go there for this project yet, but um, you know a number of our projects have, for instance, a life cycle for projects. So a project may be incubated. It may be uh, in an incubation state for a certain period of time until it hits certain certain uh, maturity levels, and then it can go to a mature project or, you know, some of our projects have a multi-tiered structure where it goes, some projects are actually elevated into a core project. And part of that depends on sort of how the project or the TSC wants to structure releases. We have some projects that go on a, on a release train. If you're ready, you're ready. If you're not, you're not, and you miss the train. Um, and whoever's ready for that release, go forward. Um, some of our projects have a simultaneous release plan where everything goes at the exact same time and into one big release. And then yet some of our other projects have like a hybrid model where there's a core set of projects that are on a simultaneous release and then uh, there's a release train for uh, everything else around it, you know, ancillary modules, supporting tooling, things like that, that, you know, require a, a core release in order to actually affect their release. So, um, you know, all that kind of goes hand in hand. I, I'm just raising this right now not to confuse it situation or to raise more questions and answers, but I just want to give you a, sort of a, a preview of where many of these discussions ultimately end up going. So, so um, uh, sorry, this is Mick. Um, is there an expectation of a project as a domain of interest, or is a project as something that has a beginning and an end? Um, uh, I mean, one of the things that it just, and, and I'm sorry, I just and I just literally just got a chance to look at this real quickly. Uh, but one of the things I was noticing is there's, you know, when are you done? There's there's no uh, sense of capturing the extent of um, of the project and the proposal. What are the boundaries? Uh, when to start? What 
what are you what have you accomplished when you're finished? Well, I, I think part of it's the open source project nature of this. You know, it, it's typical yeah. in, a, in a sort of a standards model to have a start and an end point, um, but in an open source project, it, it continuously evolves indefinitely. Um, you know, this project's a while. Yeah, I, I, uh, yeah, which clinic. which makes it more of a which makes it more of a domain of interest kind of of description. Right. Um, and, and I'm just right. I'm calibrating my reading of of the template based on that. So. Yeah, in fact, right. I, think, I think there's... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. I was, uh, sorry, Mike. I was just going to say, I think there's really sort of uh, uh, multiple sort of facets to this. Um, you know, when I think about, you know, open source and the nature of a project, typically that's going to be a component um, or potentially a set of components um, that, you know, have some defined scope and, and, and set, set of capability. And you're going to work on those things for quite some time, and you certainly need to uh, sustain them even when they're "quote unquote" done, right? Because you're never really done. Um, and then there's, um, you know, whether it's a feature or whether it's a new, uh, uh, you know, a, a new thought on refactoring some capability to improve performance or security or stability or what have you. Um, and then so you're have in other words. A, a, in other Sorry, words, the template that. should. Uh, in other words, the template should cover a range of uh, different sizes of, uh, I mean, quote unquote projects. Well, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, I, mean, I, I think we just have sort of, you know, there, there are different things, and and sort of, of course, what we're struggling with, I think, initially, is just what's the first thing <laughs> or things, um, you know, that we'll be building, and how do they how do they relate and fit to, together with one another and so forth. But, um, and, and so we had a little bit of a unique challenge initially. But I think ultimately we would have, you know, I, I think as Mike said, we would have some notion of life cycle. I mean, even in the context of, um, you know, open source components, um, there are, you know, as, my, as Mike mentioned, there's different, there's stuff that's, you know, core and maybe that's, you know, what defines, uh, you know, a release and what defines certification and so forth. Uh, criteria for branding, you know, use of, of the brand and so forth. And then there are active projects, and then there are probably, um, you know, sort of deprecated projects and, and maybe completely archived projects. And so we would have to define a project life cycle for those components. And then also, I think, you know, to your point, um, there are going to be, you know, uh, somebody wants to take on either a facet or a new feature. And so that needs some sort of a uh, you know, proposal to go with it and, and to, to build support within the community and to get others to say, yeah, you know, who's with me? Um, and, and to go off on that and get the TSC to sort of um, uh, sanction that. Um, and we probably do want to have some sort of an incubation process that people can, um, you know, start down a particular, you know, fork um, and, and work some, some new refactoring or some new feature and so forth. Um, to bring, you know, to get that to a different level of maturity, to get it to be um, more thoroughly evaluated or so forth, um, and then potentially make a plea, you know, uh, to to have it be, you know, added to the, um, you know, to the active projects or to the cores, the case may be. So I, I think that that might, that that sounds to me like what you were sort of looking for is that whole life cycle, and then defining sort of what the process would be. Is that right? Yeah, and I, I was just looking to kick off this discussion. I, I, I know nobody's ready to approve any projects right now, but right. when you get a point of um, you know having some clarity in terms of what the code base and how you want to get started with the code and modules and things like that, I wanted people to start thinking about this because it does come up, and if you start thinking about it later on, then it's chaos when you're trying to get code approved and get a start. So. Right. Yeah, I, I would encourage people to look at, you know, there's some other projects we host that I'm, you know, going to point out as, you know, sort of fairly mature processes around this. If you go and take a look at Open Daylight or if you go and take a look at All Scene Alliance, uh, they have pretty uh, strong documentation on their wikis detailing the whole process about how to propose a project, the templates, how the review will happen, when the review <laughs> Matt, um, what the review stages are, things like that are 
probably helpful uh, for everybody to just see you know how some other projects have, have done it and you can even see some of the the projects there in terms of the scope and you know unlike a standards effort it, it really is more about approving of scope of a project and knowing that you know a certain project has a certain scope that they're working on and you know that way you know what everybody's at least doing is helpful usually what were those two um mike uh, open daylight and the other one all seen alliance a l l s e e n alliance.org and opendaylight.org if you go to the linux foundation collaborative projects uh page off our lf website you, you should see the logos and links to them too if you didn't catch that Okay, and go to the wikis in particular. The uh, templates are up on the wiki. So wiki.allseenalliance.org and wiki.opendaylight.org are the two where they have those. Okay, um, that's a little bit more than I plan to spend on this topic. Uh, I think it's a good discussion though. And uh, Vipin's email, you know, at least can kick off a thread around sort of where, where this should be going. Um, some good comments already. Um, I do want to make sure <laughs> Uh, you know, try to keep to an agenda, but um, sometimes uh, the value of the current discussion takes over. Um, we only have about 20 minutes left, and uh, we had discussion on basic use cases to address and uh, discussion on initial proposed contributions and how things could be converged as the two primary topics. I know there have been some discussions uh, in various forum going on. Um, I don't know, you know if, if somebody is prepared to lead a discussion here or um, uh, raise anything. So I, I don't have anybody assigned. Do you, mean a discussion, do you mean a discussion about use cases or about initial contribution? Which of those two? Both. Um, those are the two items that I had on the agenda reserve just because I, I think they're important topics, but I didn't have anybody uh, tagged to lead a discussion here. So, and, and I'm I don't know if anybody had anything that they were prepared to say or discuss on use cases or proposed contributions. And on proposed contributions, this is uh, Shaul from, from Digital Asset. Um, there, right now, I, I, I'm aware of, uh, of two proposed initial contributions, which is one that we've, we've uh, put out about two weeks ago. But since then, we've also seen the, um, the IBM proposed contribution uh, which we've we've started looking at, and, and uh, it looks like a direction that uh, um, that that we can back as well. And I'd like to we have some thoughts about it, so so I'd like to firm those up over the next few days and send that out on the mailing list before uh, the next meeting. Uh, and Mick, I'd be glad if, if uh, you can send the presentation that uh, the Intel presentation as well uh, on the mailing list. Uh, I'm not aware if there are any other proposals right now right now out there. Yeah, so shall, I, I think I sent out Mick's presentation with the uh, email I sent yesterday to the TSC list. Okay, I know you've been okay. traveling, you may have, but uh, take a look at the list and you should see that presentation there. Um, and uh, it sounds, so you, you were responding to Ben's email, I think it was last week, that he sent out with a proposal? Yes. Okay, so it sounds like uh, you'll have some thoughts on that that you can share in the next few days? Yep. Okay. Um, is it worth going into use cases or anything else right now, or is is that something that's all dependent sort of on on that discussion? I think it's I think it's dependent on that discussion, but I would be glad if if everyone can take a look and try to see um, uh, map use and use cases that they have, and and so that when we have a discussion, it's a it's a quality discussion around. Um, do we address our use cases with specific proposals? Um, I think that's, most of our feedback is going to be about that, is, is to, to ensure that, uh, that this is a stack that, that we can start using as soon as possible uh, around use cases. Uh, so I think, I think it would be, we'd have a quality, quality discussion if everyone would look at it with, those, uh, uh, with that in mind. Okay. So should we discuss Ben's proposal at all, or should we pump that too? I don't know, Ben or Chris from IBM. Uh, yeah, this is Ben. I, I would prefer to uh, pump that to either next week or whenever that uh, we got some feedback. 
um, it's, uh, some, also some elements of that uh, uh, outdated at this point and I'd like to write up a different proposal uh, when I have an opportunity. By the way, next week uh, we have uh, IBM has a conference um, and uh, uh, I, I, I am going to be there. I'm not sure if Chris be there or not, so um, I might not be able to participate next uh, Thursday. Okay. Um, Chris, will you be able to be present next Thursday for that discussion? or? Did we lose Chris? Are you on mute? Ah, the old double mute trick. <laughs> I thought I unmuted, but I unmuted only only half of it. Um, uh, so yeah, I, I will be on the call. Um, uh, it'll be 7 a.m. for me. Uh, I'll you know I'll be in uh, all the IBM is anyway. I'll be in Vegas. Um, I, I'm I'm hoping that you know we can have a substantive discussion next week on our proposal. Um, I mean, I'm certain that, you know, uh, well, we, we could discuss the proposal that we sent out last week, but I think, you know, as has been indicated, there has been some feedback and we're, you know, sort of going through and, and doing another sort of um, another pass at it. And I, and, I, and I know that, you know, others probably have some feedback and, again, we're happy to, um, to, to, to have feedback from, from anyone. Um, on uh, on on the uh, on the project, whether you're on the TS, TSC or not. Um, uh, but uh, again, I think the hope would be that we get something out in the next couple of days that gives people an opportunity to sort of fully digest it, and um, and then maybe we can have something meaningful to to, to pursue going forward. Um, at least that's my hope. Okay. Well. I, I know there's a lot of side discussions and things going on. It would be good if we can get that conversation out in the open as soon as possible. I know there's some, you know, a lot of things that people are working through, and it, it's hard to do that. Um, and yeah. there's a lot of complexity in this initial discussion. Um, so the faster, you know, you guys, whenever everybody's available to start sharing some of those plans, that would be yeah. helpful. Um, so we've got the call next week. Chris, are you going to be on the call next week if Ben can? Yeah. Okay. I, I will then, be on, yes. Okay, so uh, we can still keep a discussion next week. And then um, one other thing I was thinking about, or I should say Todd actually raised and I thought it was a good idea, was we did have uh, one face-to-face -face meeting of the technical community prior to the, to the public announcement. But uh, should we start planning another face-to-face -face for the technical community to get together and um, it, it usually takes a lot of logistics to find a date that works for everybody, find the location and, and all of that. So if it is of interest, I would like to start putting uh, some feelers out to figure out, you know, if somebody wants to host yeah. me, if we have a conference venue, um, all so, those things. I, I actually think that would be good. I was also thinking that if we could get to, uh, you know, uh, you know, get to consensus on an initial starting point, um, and a, um, uh, you know, and, and a sort of a near-term uh, set of proposed um, experiments and so forth. That um, we could actually, you know, possibly get everybody together, you know, from an engineering perspective, into a co-located situation for some period of time, you know, small, you know, maybe a, a week or, or two, to actually get this thing, um, get the party started, so to speak. Um, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, especially with open source, you're dealing with highly distributed community and, and you know, getting to know one another is, you know, the initial challenge that everybody sort of has. But if you you know if we can bring everybody together, so we were exploring different ideas of you know maybe hosting some space in Raleigh for a short period of time where we could um, uh, you know invite uh, those who who would like to you know contribute to the initial sprint if you will um, to come down and 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 collaborate and participate. Maybe we could have face to face as part of that to to have you know higher level. Um, 
discussions and and to you know make sure that we're set on a a clear course and speed. So, Chris, this is Mike. Sorry. Um, do you think we know what problem we're solving yet well enough to start picking a horse? Um, okay. So and, I think. And by the way, there question. there are. Uh, I think the the discussion would would be around and by and I think if we go back and we say okay you know we pretty much all have agreement on what communications are going to look like that would be a great starting mm -hmm. place for this and I think it would provide a great foundation on which we could start layering uh, yeah. the next level of work. Um, I'm just uh, I and I will express my desire here, um, which is to see. Um, a sufficiently diverse set of use cases covered. Yeah. Um, that that we make sure we're uh, meeting the needs of all of the participants. So I I, I think Mick, that's that's um, entirely fair, and I I suspect that a lot of us believe that we understand <laughs> what we <laughs> have in in terms of um, vision for for what use cases and so forth. Um, I think. You're probably absolutely right, though, that what we lack is a broader consensus amongst you know us collectively um, as the Hyperledger project community, um, uh, an agreement about what that set is. I uh, I think IBM and, and certainly I uh, tend to share I think the, the the thought that you just expressed about you know satisfying a broad set of use cases. Certainly, that's what we've been looking at. There is. If you explore the IBM proposal uh, and the code that we released uh, and, and linked into the Hyperledger uh, through the read, the, the mic, I should say, I, I linked in through the Hyperledger uh, README, um, you, you'll find, you know, uh, sort of a white paper that describes what problems we think we're trying to solve, and um, there's an extensive discussion around some of the use cases. Um, uh, certainly, at least from a Higher level perspective. I don't know that we get into specific uh, applications, but um, I, you know, I, I think certainly we'd love to get feedback on some of those thoughts. Um, uh, you know, it's out there, and and again, whether the feedback is shared, you know, just with IBM or you know, preferably shared in the Hyperledger community, you know, we'd love to have it. I think we. Uh, I think uh, I, I agree with Chris. We we understand the use cases, and and I, I didn't see any uh, uh, disagreement even in the face to face around what the use cases are. Uh, there's there's still a bit of uh, disagreement on what what is the best technical way to uh, uh, to address these use cases. Uh, but I think we're at a point that we can we can start agreeing uh, uh, on on the first steps forward in a way that would stay broad enough not to silo us off into specific use cases. Uh, so I, I have a feeling, again, this is show from the left, I have a feeling that at least on, on what are we trying to solve, uh, I think we're, we're, there is pretty much consensus and, and, uh, and those use cases that uh, IBM gave as an example are, uh, are the same as we'd expect to see in any proposal. So can I put you guys on the spot? It sounds like Shaw and IBM, you guys are talking about this proposal and coming up with one that you're going to share in three or four days or something. Can I put you guys on the spot to talk through this next week for the agenda? Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, I said, this is Shulgin. We'll, we'll try to send uh, in advance. It's kind of a hectic week, but we'll try to send in advance on, on the mailing list our thoughts um, so that people have time to respond to that. That would be good. And, and I, it sounds like from Mick's comments, anything you can add in terms of the use cases that you're trying to address would probably be helpful along with that proposal. Chris, have you pub have you posted the link to that document on the mailing list yet? I think I probably have it in in some notes. It's, it's some conversations it's, with it's, John. But. Um. I don't know if we posted the list, but I'm happy to do that. That'd be great. Thanks. Yep. You're referring to the the white paper that you posted on GitHub. Is that right, Chris? 
That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I'll just kind of agree with, with both Chris and this is David, uh, David Bull, uh, Chuka Morgan. You know, having read through that, well, I agree with pretty much with what uh, Chris and Shaw stated that I think, you know, what they've kind of laid out in the white paper at a high level at least, you know, seems pretty consistent. Um, so I think that's a good, certainly a starting place for people to understand what we're trying to achieve here. Okay, so Chris, if you can post that list or link out to the mailing list, maybe that'd be helpful just to get that in front of everybody so people can start to comment if if that's I think do that. Yep. Agreement. And it, and in fact, you know, I mean, you know, one way we could, uh, you know, again, this is, you know, we're starting a, a you know a project here. You know, this is this white paper represents IBM's thinking and you know, you know what went into some of the design decisions we had for you know the code that we are proposing to contribute. Um, but it might be worthwhile that we as a community also develop something at a high level that essentially tries to do the same for whatever we create. So, you know, I, I don't necessarily think we want to start with that uh, big gate because I think we could argue a lot of for pros. But um, certainly, it, it's a way of helping to shape some of the some of the thought process. Um, so I'm happy to share this, and if we want to, you know, start down the path of, of creating and editing something that tries to outline what we think are use cases and and how they're addressed and so forth. You know, we could contemplate doing that as well, sort of um, in conjunction with the code that we start developing. I, I, I will Todd. say, oh, go ahead. This is Todd Ruck. I think that's a great idea. Take a good a good collaborative canvas for that for that use case and the and the high level design is going to be Really great. This is <laughs> this is Ram Jagadeesan. Um, uh, I agree with that. I think that just sounds like a great idea. Um, uh, you, you, we have a broader set of use cases, such as IoT, in mind. So it would be kind of good to have a broader discussion around, uh, you know, what are the use cases that we would like to address uh, in the larger project. I've I've seen a lot of projects go through this very discussion, and and I think that's a very helpful thing to do in order to get everyone into the same mindset, and also to help communicate externally what the project is trying to do and 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 what it's focused on. So if we can get there at some point, that would be that would be outstanding. All right. So um, I guess what we'll do then. Uh, since we have a couple minutes left, we'll wrap up. Um, we will focus the entire call next week, if, since I don't have any other agenda items, um, on this particular topic. And uh, if I can put IBM and DH on the spot to kick off that discussion. If anybody else has other agenda items they want to discuss or other proposals that I'm not aware of that are floating around, um, let me know as soon as possible, just because I, I, I don't want to skip agenda topics that people want to see from the TSC. Um, so any TSC members, if you've got something you want to talk through, <laughs> let me know. Um, I, I'm just sort of winging it right now based on what I'm hearing from people until we get a TSC chair who can officially sort of uh, organize things at this point. Uh, though, if uh, you do have something else you'd like to see on the agenda, you can tell me now or we can uh, uh, discuss it over email and I can slot it in for next week. But I, I do think the key topic here is to start trying to get through the discussion of proposals and how we get started on the code base. Are there any other topics for next week? Okay. And for the TSC members, uh, we you you now have the nomination list. Uh, we have two candidates. Emmanuel sent me an email. Uh, apparently he's offline today and, and couldn't join, or, or I'm sorry, David at Accenture had sent me an email that Emmanuel couldn't join today, but um, there is another candidate. Uh, we will have a Condorcet vote link sent out to the TSC um, from Todd or I, most likely Todd, um, but we'll get that out uh, to kick off the voting and uh, elect the TSC chair. Okay. Anything else before we close? I 
That's great. Okay, we're good. Okay, sounds good. I will uh, talk to everybody next week and look for an email from Shaw or Chris or Ben or somebody uh, with some sort of uh, new proposal. Cool. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mike. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you.